Okay, so we are in chapter 18. This is the deep sea. So, we just finished up talking last cycle about the epipelagic zone, which is the surface layer of the ocean. It goes from about the surface to about 200 meters. Um, and then below that, we have the mesopelagic zone. Um, and that goes from about 200 meters to 1,000 meters. And after the mesopelagic zone, from 1,000 meters all the way down to the bottom, we consider that to be the deep sea. Um, there are different zones in the deep sea, but for our purposes, all of those different zones, we are just going to lump into the one term. So, the epipelagic zone, that surface layer of the water, is where there's enough light for photosynthesis to occur, so we call that the photic zone. Um, and then, the mesopelagic zone in the deep sea, um, there's not enough light for photosynthesis. So in the mesopelagic zone, there's still enough light um, like for, for you to be able to see um, if you're a fish or something that, like that that lives there. However, in the deep sea, there's no light whatsoever. Okay, so mesopelagic zone still maybe still enough light to be able to see, and then after that, um, there's no light whatsoever. Okay, so the ocean's depths, the mesopelagic and the deep sea. Um, the mesopelagic zone and everything underneath that lack or shares a common feature. Okay, they do not have food that is formed from primary production by photosynthesis because there's not enough light for that to occur. So that means that all of the creatures in this zone actually rely on food that comes from the surface. And because there's not as much food down here, because it, they all rely on what comes from the surface, that means that there's fewer animals that can live down here um, because there's not a lot of food for them. They the animals that live in the mesopelagic zone and the deep sea also depend on the surface for oxygen. Okay, um, and we need to look at like how oxygen actually gets into the water and discuss how these creatures can actually get oxygen. So the two things that animals need, food and oxygen, and those two things are lacking in the mesopelagic zone and the deep sea. So um, they need to figure out ways to deal with that and or have ways to get food and oxygen in order to survive. So, how does oxygen get into the surface or into the water? Um, basically what happens is at the surface of the water, the water comes into contact with the atmosphere and there's lots of oxygen in the atmosphere and so with waves and currents and all of these things churning up the water, oxygen can get dissolved into the water. And then, in the epipelagic zone, the photic, zo photic zone, where photosynthesis is occurring, you get lots of photosynthesis. And one of the products of photosynthesis is oxygen. So you get oxygen dissolved in the water that way. But below that, okay, in the mesopelagic zone in deep sea, there's no photosynthesis because there's not enough light, and it doesn't come in contact with the surface. So how do we get oxygen? Well, here's what would happen. So if the oceans were just stagnant, they did not have any sort of current whatsoever, um, then there would be no oxygen in the deep sea and in the mesopelagic zone, and you would not have life down there. But, good thing for us, that is not actually the case. The water is moving. So here's basically what happens. There are certain places on Earth where the water um, on the surface can get very cold very fast and those are just south of Greenland um, and then in the Norwegian Sea and down in the Weddell Sea and near Antarctica. Um, and so when water becomes really really cold really fast it becomes denser and you know that dense water sinks below less dense water. So this water on the surface gets so dense that it will actually sink all the way down to the bottom of the ocean. And once it sinks to the bottom of the ocean, it spreads out okay, and will travel along the bottom of the ocean till it gets warmed back up and will come back up to the surface. And so when that water sinks down to the bottom, it captures the oxygen that was in that surface water and then brings that oxygen down to the deep sea with it and therefore brings oxygen down to the deep sea um, and can allow creatures to survive down there. So here's the, um, the actual blanks for your notes. 
So this whole process is called thermohaline circulation, um, and it is driven by density differences in water. So remember when we talked about uh, last semester the gyres that form in the surface waters of the open ocean? Those were driven by winds. Um, these currents are driven by density differences. So differences in the density of water. And so when the surface water sinks, it brings oxygen to the deep. So that's one way that oxygen can get down. And, you know, sometimes too, like, water will become more cold and sink down um, in the water, but it's not going to be, you know, so dense that it sinks all the way to the bottom. And when it does that, it'll bring uh, oxygen to different levels of the ocean as well. Um, so you can see where the deep water forms and then where it surfaces in the Indian and Pacific Ocean. And it releases a large amount of carbon dioxide when it does that, when it comes back up. Um, here's a picture just to show you the current. So the blue arrows, our blue lines represent the deep cold water currents, and then the red lines represent the warm surface water currents. So you can see this current um, goes through the entire ocean, through all of the oceans um, of the world. It's pretty cool. It brings oxygen to the deep. Okay, so the twilight zone, or the mesopelagic, this is from 200 meters down to 1,000 meters. Um, at the top of the twilight zone, there's enough light in order to probably be able to read a newspaper, but there's not enough light to do photosynthesis. So it's part of the aphotic zone, no photosynthesis. After 3,300 feet, you start the deep sea and there's no light whatsoever. Um, also in the mesopelagic zone, we get the major thermocline of the ocean. So if you remember last semester, we said that the thermocline is um, a rapid change in temperature with depth. Um, the main thermocline of the ocean occurs here in the mesopelagic. So in the mesopelagic, you get a rapid drop in temperature as you go down. Um, and so if you're a fish that lives down here in the mesopelagic zone and you're going to be going up and down in the mesopelagic, you have to be able to deal with a big change in temperature because it changes rapidly. So this um, shows you a picture. This epipelagic up here, um, it's pretty much the same temperature uh, throughout the entire epipelagic because it's well mixed by currents and by waves, and so this surface water gets well mixed. Under here, okay, in the mesopelagic zone, there is very little, like there's not really mixing because there's no waves, there's no wind, and there's not really current. So you get layers of water that form based on their temperature, their density. So you get a rapid drop in temperature with depth here in the mesopelagic zone. And then below the mesopelagic zone, the temperature is fairly constant, about 4 degrees Celsius. Okay, so even though there's not really primary productivity in the mesopelagic zone, um, we still have a lot of animals that will live here. Not as many that can live in the epipelagic, but still many. Um, and the animals that live here are called midwater animals. You get basically the same groups of animals as the epipelagic. Um, so you're going to have like krill and copepods and stuff like that, but they're just going to look a little bit different than they do in the epipelagic zone. Um, so it'll just, it just depends. Um, you also have lots of fish, okay? You'll have things that, like, that are called ostracods, that are crustaceans that look like tiny clams with legs. Um, and you have a lot of bioluminescent creatures that live down here, um, meaning they can produce their own light. Here's just some pictures. So this is an ostracod right here. Um, other types of things that you'll find down here, you'll see lots of comb jellies, lots of jellyfish, and then siphonophores which are kind of related to um, Portuguese man of war. You do find squid down here, so this is the vampire squid, um, and then this is just another kind of mesopelagic squid. So they're weird looking, but they are actually perfectly adapted for their habitat. Here's your fish. So mesopelagic fish are usually pretty small, meaning between one and four inches. So those are, that's tiny. Um, when we see pictures of fish from like the mesopelagic zone, they look huge. They look like they're giant and they're going to eat us. But that's not true. They're actually very small, between one and four inches. Um, bristlemouse and lanternfish are the most abundant fish in the mesopelagic zone, we think, because whenever we trawl 
uh, meaning we drag a net behind the boat at that depth, m about 90% of what we pull up are these bristle mouths and lantern fish. So this is, uh, the pictures on the last slide were the bristle mouths, these are lantern fish, okay? Um, so these are small little fish, and there's actually schools of them in the mesopelagic zone, which is the picture on the bottom right. Um, here's just different types of midwater fish. So they all have really scary sounding names like hatchet fish and viper fish, etc. Um, and they do look kind of scary, but remember, I think we, most of them are between one and four inches long. So very small. They sound scary, but they're small. You can have angler fish as well in the mesopelagic. They're more common in the deep sea, but you'll find them in the mesopelagic as well. Um, and notice those are sitting on hand, so they're very small little fish. Here's some of your other ones. This is a hatchet fish, dragonfish, snake mackerel, saber tooth fish, and then your little lancet, or big lancet fish. Um, so large creatures are the lancet fish. Okay, so the picture you see on the right is the black scabbard fish, another mesopelagic fish, and they look really freaky and weird and scary, um, but they are actually very, very well adapted for the environment that they live in. And we'll talk about why. So, most of the ha the adaptations that we see um, in midwater animals, particularly fish, are because um, there's not very much food there compared to the epiplegic. So only about 20% of the food that is produced in the epiplegic ever makes it to the mesopelagic. And so because there's less food, <coughs> you have fewer animals. Um, and most of the characteristics that you see of the midwater animals are related to the lack of food. So they are small because doesn't it takes a lot of energy to grow large. So they will be small so that they will not have to put their energy into growing. Um, and let's look at that. So other adaptations that they will have, um, they will have huge mouths and have hinged extendable jaws and long sharp teeth. Okay, those are for a good reason. Um, they need to be able to eat whatever comes by because there's not a lot of food and so they need to be able to eat whatever they can. So they have these big mouths to be able to accommodate whatever comes by and jaws that can open really long, wide in order to be able to open their large mouths. And then teeth in order to grab on to whatever swims by so that um, it doesn't get away and they get their food. <clears throat> they also have really broad diets down here because they can't be picky because they have to be able to eat whatever comes by or else if they say they don't like squid then they won't, and a squid swims by and they won't eat it, who knows, the next meal may be you know, two months away. So they have to be able to eat whatever, whenever, and not be picky.